Thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually going to start with uh, talking a little bit actually about the vaccines, um, if I could, and then talk about schools um, and talk about the response, because I think that um, it's important to, to put this all in the context of history. Um, the reason I want to talk about the vaccines and immunity, though, is to clear up some of the misconceptions, I think, around variants and and immunity uh, that are out there uh, right now with the Omicron variant. So, um, and how immunity works. So let's just start with that. Um, let me share my screen. So, okay, so just to start actually like taking a step back, how do infections enter human populations? They enter human populations through human, uh, uh, things that humans are doing um, to the environment. So essentially, Global warming is putting pathogens closer in touch with um, hosts that they've never seen before. Our treatment of animals and zoonoses is fundamentally responsible for both HIV and the COVID pandemic because it's really the bushmeat trade with HIV and our treatment of animals and, and different animals with um, COVID-19 that had these intra-human populations. Uh, changes in agriculture and what we're doing to attract new pests um, that we encroach onto animal habitats, which is bringing us into the possibility of more pandemics. We are more crowded together. Uh, jet travel spreads infectious disease quickly. And then really the breakdown of public health measures, poverty, war, famine, terrorism. These are all really leading to what happened with COVID-19, which is essentially fundamentally the entrance of new infectious diseases into humans. You know, remember that COVID-19 is not the first time a coronavirus turned deadly. There's been three times. There's actually uh, four common cold coronaviruses that caused the common cold, but there's been three times in history that a coronavirus has been able to cause more severe disease. The first time in recent history, the first time was in 2003. This was the SARS pandemic. And the, uh, the original um, animal was probably the bat went into something called the palm civet and then went into humans. It lasted about nine months in the world. Um, it didn't spread as readily and it was about 8,100 cases, 774 deaths, and then it ended. And MERS was the second time a coronavirus became deadly and, and could cause this severe disease, which is called uh, ARDS. And all cases in that case were linked to the Middle East. It was also uh, relatively limited, two cases only in the US. Um, and, it was, and its source was from the bat to the camel. And then this new coronavirus or relatively new SARS-CoV-2, um, it was December 31st, 2019, that a healthcare worker, um, an ophthalmologist uh, uh, blew the whistle and told uh, the WHO this was happening, these severe illnesses and uh, in Wuhan. And then January 7th, it was identified as a coronavirus. It's been spreading since then. January 30th, it was a global health emergency. March 11th, 2020, it's the pandemic. And we know that it's most likely came from a bat, but we actually don't know what happened after that in terms of which animal it went through to get to humans. And then the cases worldwide now has been 348 million, but, um, but uh, the deaths worldwide have been more in the countries here. So you can see the darker countries, including the United States, have carried more of the deaths. Um, and that's 6.9 million worldwide. The 1918 influenza pandemic killed between 50 and 100 million. So the reason I want to talk about the vaccines is I think that um, it, it helps me talk about immunity, which is what's, I think, increasing in the world right now and happening. So essentially, the three that we have approved in this country are Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. But there are actually nine vaccines. Uh, out there that the WHO has approved, except for Sputnik V for some reason, even though Sputnik V is an excellent vaccine made in Russia, they were willing to give it out for less than $10. Um, and the dub, I think it's clear, but the WHO has not um, approved this particular vaccine. Otherwise, all of these vaccines on the list are approved. The first six all involve the spike protein, which is the little piece of protein that sticks out from the virus. And um, and uh, connects to uh, the cell. And the bottom three are what are called whole inactivated variants. And this will become important because it's a more traditional vaccine. And especially the bottom one from India, it actually has a lot of effect, uh, effectiveness data out of it. And it shows you the whole vaccine. So when you think about variants that are occurring across the spike protein, seeing the whole variant would be really helpful for us to get 
uh, immunity that's across the entire virus. So this is the spike protein, though. These are the ones that we have in this country. These are the, these are the we only have three, um, and they're all involved the spike protein, they, which sticks out from the cell and uh, from the virus and sticks to the cell. And there are two types of designs of spike protein vaccines, mainly. There's one where you take what's called mRNA that codes for the spike protein, put it inside a lipid envelope, and then you put that in the body. That's Pfizer and Moderna. This is the first time mRNA vaccines have been used for a human pathogen. They, they were tried in MERS, but then as I told you, MERS went away quickly. So uh, they, didn't, they weren't needed. They've been used in some tumor vaccine technology, but otherwise it's the first time it's been applied to human pandemic. Um, so it's the mRNA of the spike protein. You make the spike protein from your own machinery, and then you raise an immune response. And then the Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik V all involve taking DNA of the spike protein, putting it inside a benign virus called adenovirus, like a cold virus that doesn't replicate. And then that's how you see the genetic material to make a spike protein and make an immune response. And then finally, um, there is one called Novavax, which is just more giving the protein. It would have been a more traditional vaccine design, again, approved by the WHO, but not here in this country. Um, and then the three inactivated uh, virus variants. So the reason I have to spend a minute talking about T cells and B cells is explains, and antibodies is explains what's going on right now with more mild infections if you've been vaccinated but not the severe disease, except in people who are unvaccinated or have certain uh, risk factors. So let me explain the immune system quickly. There are three major arms. Antibodies you produce right away, um, but they always come down with time. It's just totally normal, totally natural. We can't carry all those antibodies in our bloodstream or it'd be too, our blood would be too thick. Um, and so it's just no normal for the antibodies to go down. But luckily you have two arms of the immune system that let you make more antibodies if you see the, the uh, virus in the future. One are T cells, which protect us against severe disease. They're actually the major immune defense for viruses. And then T cells help B cells, which you have, we know we have that from the vaccines or from natural immunity because they've literally done bone marrow biopsies and lymph node biopsies shows that we produce good B cells to the vaccine. And then, your B cells can make more antibodies to the, to the virus if they see it next winter or see it in the future. And it may take a couple of days for you to make those antibodies, which is why it's so important that to know that it's not a failure of the vaccines if you have a mild infection. It may take a couple of days because you're still um, not protected up here because the antibodies come down in your upper respiratory tract, but they will make more antibodies to protect you from getting down in the lungs. And so the reason that it's important is we've had a lot of talk about waning effectiveness, but really the T cells and B cells are, are always the templates to make more antibodies. So this actually shows why in the vaccine trials of all nine of them that I told you about, this yellow column shows us that they almost completely protected against severe disease. Now, understandably, that was before the emergence of some of the variants, um, specifically Delta, because these were done with alpha, beta, gamma. But even with those, they were able, because T cells work across all variants, they were able to protect us from severe disease across all the variants that were circulating at the time that these clinical trials were done. That's the yellow line. And um, that's, they actually took the trouble in the, in the clinical trials to measure T cells and show that they, you did get T cell immunity. It's just that it's hard to measure outside the research setting, T cells. And then the three ones, two made in um, China and one made in India, the whole inactivated variant vaccines also protect against severe disease, but had variable effectiveness against mild disease. So also produce T cells. So let's talk about the variants then and will vaccines work against the variants? They will, but we have to, that's really because of T cell production. So when we saw alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and delta, remember, there was very little immunity in India when delta was first detected there, it was at the beginning of March. There was a 4% vaccination rate in India um, at the time. And delta was immediately, obviously, a terrible virulent uh, uh, pathogen. And it, with that degree of immunity, it created um, misery and, and so much suffering. Omicron, which is the last variant that we have, wasn't, didn't originate in South Africa, we had no idea where it originated, but it um, was first described by South African scientists on Thanksgiving Day. And in its case, it particularly 
is so mutated, it has 32 mutations across that spike protein and 50 across the whole virus, that it actually doesn't work as well. It is less virulent. There, that's pretty clear by now, um, both from studies in South Africa, the UK, but importantly here in California, um, I was just working in the hospital, it is, it is less virulent, but it, um, and models show us that 50% of people will see Omicron worldwide. That will likely, the global vaccine inequity problem that we have never taken responsibility for, it, unfortunately, um, it, uh, Omicron may um, infect people before we, we've, we you know, the, the US and other countries have given the vaccines out. They wasted, they're probably gonna waste 240 million doses by the end of this month, um, by the end of February. Um, and in the setting of this global vaccine inequity, it's about 9.8% vaccination rate in, of one dose of lo in low income countries. Um, if the, more people are gonna see Omicron than get vaccinated. Um, and then even who, who do get vaccinated um, and that we've still seen mild Omicron infections in the vaccinated, of course, worldwide. Um, and it does see, you then see the whole virus and you develop immunity across the whole virus. Um, but in the future, if you've never seen Omicron, if you've um, uh, never been infected with COVID, it would be getter, better to get a booster with Covaxin because it allows you to see the whole virus. But unfortunately, the Covaxin vaccine, the part of the pharmaceuticals put in the EUA to the FDA on November 5th, and they haven't approved it. Um, and the reason the Covaxin vaccine would be so important is it goes down to the age of two, so we could vaccinate little children. Um, uh, we can only vaccinate down to the age of five, and beyond that, it would let you see the whole that, uh, virus. So as we get more variants, it's important to not just have a vaccine that's against one part of the virus. It allows you to see the whole virus. So any advocacy that you can do um, for Covaxin to be approved. So, um, so the reason that we know it's important, not important to see the whole virus, but if you see the whole virus, you will get T cells, you'll get about uh, 1400 T cells that go across the entire virus. But even the spike protein, you develop about 100 T cells across the spike protein. So even in the context of um, the variants, the T cell response has still remained intact against the spike protein, but not the antibody response, which is why we're seeing more of these infections among people even who've been vaccinated, infections, but not the severe disease if you've been vaccinated because the T cell response protects against severe disease. Okay, so, um, so this question about vaccine effectiveness and, and waning, again, really, uh, really is necessary for us to remember that there's a waning of antibodies but it's really a lack of understanding the immune system that the T cells, the B cells don't wane. And what's causing um, people to have breakthrough infections are likely that the antibodies don't work as well against Omicron because it has 32 uh, mutations across its spike protein, even with the boosters and other demographic factors that influence your, um, even how much you're seeing the virus. So in high levels of circulating virus or a lot of people living together, um, that really is a risk factor for breakthrough of infection. And other um, host factors that make it harder to mount those T cells and B cells that you need are essentially old age, and I'll give you some of the risk factors for why, who needs um, more boosters, immunocompromise um, or specific underlying health conditions. And then it of course matters what vaccine you got. Again, seeing the whole virus would have been helpful, but that's not what we developed in this country. Um, Pfizer being given every three weeks, three weeks apart was not as effective as giving vaccines at a longer spacing like they did in Canada, which gave a uh, stronger immune response. On the other hand, our protection against severe disease has been, was maintained throughout Delta and has continued to be maintained in general across the population throughout. Um, even with the two dose vaccines. Uh, this is data from the CDC, and I'll come back to this um, just on January 7th, that even those who completed two doses of the vaccine series, the vaccines are working really well. Basically the risk of COVID-19 related death after a two dose series is 0. 0.00003. So very low. And then who are the people who are still at risk for COVID? Um, death after getting a COVID vaccine, there are specific risk groups, severe immunocompromised, not the population that I treat uh, with HIV, severe immunocompromised with immunocompromising medications or, um, or um, B cell depleting therapies. And the other category is over 75 
and having full, four comorbidities. So these are the patients that are still at risk. Um, and not only should they be boosted, but probably immunocompromised should get four and have been approved for four vaccines. Um, okay, so, and then the final thing I'll say about B cells is when you produce B cells and you see a variant in the future, there's now been four studies, including this one in science, that shows us that you will produce antibodies that are directed against the variant at hand because you have what's called adaptive immunity. And what adaptive immunity means is your B cells serve as the recipe book, but they don't produce antibodies against the strain that was circulating last summer. They will produce antibodies against the strain that you see in front of you. And that adaptive response of our B cells um, is why our immune systems are, are powerful even after two doses to, um, to, to see and adapt to variants in the future. For example, um, there were people who had been infected in 1918 with influenza and um, 80 years later, they found them and at, 90 years later actually, and studied their B cell immunity. And they had developed B cells because they'd been infected with influenza in 1918 and 90 years later, they were able to produce antibodies uh, 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 stimulated to produce antibodies against that original strain. So you, your B cells last a long time, 90 to 100 years, at least in that case. So that is really the power of immunity. And then unfortunately, again, we don't have the Covaxin down to two here, but we do have vaccines down to five um, uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. And, uh, and likely if we'd given them at a longer dosing pattern, which was not what the, what the pharmaceutical companies wanted, um, they wanted it three weeks, but that's how they studied it. But any country who um, took eight weeks between doses had a much higher effectiveness level, actually against all of the effects of COVID, um, both uh, uh, mild infections and severe infections, if you give vaccines more spaced apart. And likely also vaccines are more safe if you give them farther apart. One reason that Canada gave vaccines in young people at eight weeks is because they had a lower rate of myocarditis if you space out the vaccines by eight weeks. Okay, so why do we know that uh, COVID-19 cannot be eradicated? And why are, we, why are we talking about this word in that? It actually doesn't have to do with human behavior. It doesn't have to do with humans not being good enough or doing the right things. It has to do with fundamental properties of the virus, why it can't be eradicated. The four properties of a virus that make it eradicable are having no animal reservoir. The COVID-19 has, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has many animal reservoirs. So at one time in Denmark, they killed all the mink um, thinking that they could eradicate it. So, so you can't eradicate a virus that has animal reservoirs. The second feature that doesn't make it amenable to eradication is that it looks like a lot of other respiratory pathogens. It looks like influenza, it looks like parainfluenza, it looks like RSV. And it looks like, especially after vaccination, the normal circulating coronaviruses, the more mild coronaviruses. So because of that, only when you look like yourself, like smallpox, it looks like this. We knew what smallpox looked like. Nothing else looked like smallpox. And, um, but, but this has features that look like a lot of other viruses. The third reason is that it has a longer period of infectiousness. So you can be infectious before you're symptomatic. And then the fourth reason is that, um, it has a great vaccine. These COVID vaccines work very well, but they're not what are called sterilizing. They don't, uh, your antibodies will naturally come down the time in the upper airways. Um, and so COVID will get under control and likely Omicron will drive it under control because it's causing so much immunity and it will cause get under control from a lot of immunity. But it, it will never unfortunately be not with us, which is why therapeutics are so important because for those who have declined vaccination, we have to treat them compassionately. And beyond that, um, uh, for those who are at risk for severe breakthroughs or with immunocompromised, we need good therapeutics. And now we have them, they're just not uh, here to the level that we need. The two therapeutics that we have are Molnupiravir and Paxlovid. They're both what are called oral antivirals. They're like HIV drugs, they work they work uh, with precision, especially Paxlovid against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. If we had had more Paxlovid this winter, it would have been profoundly important because anyone who's at risk for a severe breakthrough could be given Paxlovid or unvaccinated patients could be given Paxlovid and they reduce the risk of severe hospitalizations and death by 89%. 
um, if you're unvaccinated and at risk for severe disease. So I think PAX, we have monoclonal antibodies, but they're actually quite hard to give. Um, uh, and, and logistically, Paxlovid is an oral pill, five, a five day course would make a huge difference. Um, and then measles and um, pertussis are good examples of infections under control. Measles is only under control with um, a vaccine, even though a lot of our vaccine rates have fallen off during the COVID pandemic. So we're worried we're gonna see more outbreaks of measles. Pertussis is under control in the same way that COVID will be under control, which is with a combination of vaccines and therapeutics. Pertussis has an um, a antibiotic that works against it. So the reason that children are less at risk for COVID-19 is actually biologic and it's very unusual. Um, it was never, we never saw this with the influenza pandemic in 1918. And in fact, uh, influenza affects the extremes of age more. So young, much younger, much older. In the case of COVID-19, we've never seen an infection like this that, has, um, that doesn't uh, cause severe disease in children to the same rate. Um, in England, at least, um, 25, ch 25 children have died, died from March 20th to February 2021 uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and then in here in this country, uh, in terms of children, We've had 840, eight out of over 850,000 deaths overall. And unfortunately, uh, then they mostly are in adults. And those under 18, they're just spared the severe disease to a large degree. It's a very particular biologic reason why that's true. Um, one thing has to do with ACE2 receptors. This is the receptor that you imbibe the virus with into your nose and enters your body. Children have lower expression, nasal gene expression of this particular receptor that makes the virus enter the body. Uh, the other reason that children are so much less at risk for severe disease, again, haven't seen this with other infections, is has to do with their innate immune response. Um, our innate immunity is what causes a lot of the damage early on, our, our fighting off the infection. It's why we use steroids um, for people with severe infection, but they have different types of innate immunity and they don't in a way um, cause self damage with, with getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. So that's the other reason why their immunity doesn't cause the damn immunopathology. In terms of school closures, I think it's important to say that we have never in the history of infectious diseases used school closures as a major tool to fight pandemics because of the importance of schools. Um, only in the setting of infections that um, are what are called childhood diseases like diphtheria, pertussis, measles, mumps, um, rubella, uh, where schools closed and then that was temporary. Even influenza, which is an infection that affects the young, um, the traditional pandemic playbook, and these are all of our national strategies, didn't use school closures as a strategy because schools are really safe places. Um, and the reason is it has to do with less infectiousness essentially specifically with COVID-19 um, from children. Now, um, uh, and the other reason that schools weren't closed were really a fundamentally progressive reason, which is that, um, uh, which is that uh, in the 1918 influenza pandemic, it was clear that how much children needed school and how much they needed education because differential effects of learning loss would occur among the poor. And so essentially, what happened in the setting of 1918 is that um, New York was asked to close their schools and so was Chicago and they said no. And the reason they said no is they said that we're progressive cities, uh, 750,000 of our children out of a million uh, live in low income settings and they need to be in school. They need their lunch in school, they need their socializations in school. And so New York City and Chicago and a few other progressive cities around the country um, did not close their schools um, and other school, other places closed their schools for four months. The reason again that they didn't, and this is an interesting historical look at this, is because they said that schools, children were better contained in school, that regular medical inspections could identify sick students and keep healthy ones safe, and that it was a, especially in the setting of school nurses, which emerged from, um, from the influenza pandemic, that it was a safe environment and um, and and that they essentially fundamentally people, especially low-income children, needed school for a variety of reasons. There was a 
long period after the 1918 pandemic that even in the places that closed schools for four months, there were learning losses that ended up leading to different, and we have the science side of history, but they led to differential ability to seek occupation. Um, could they weren't people weren't able to continue in school, especially low income settings, um, and there was lo lifelong effects of school for the poor. And so again, um, better off in school. And this is another article about this about how um, the public health strategies traditionally had never included school closures because of a, such a um, it did include, though, mitigation procedures in schools, um, and this is a picture in the Ontario schools that they're blowing their noses to get to get germs out, essentially. But a, a lot of these ideas of outside of ventilation, of avoiding crowds, of hand hygiene, of staying home when you're ill, a lot of these ideas um, uh, came about from the influenza pandemic. And again, I told you that some places did close schools, but they um, did it just for a couple, four months. Berkeley closed them for four months. Um, there was a lot of uh, outside time and a lot of wide open windows. And I think ventilation is profoundly important for respiratory pathogens, including COVID-19. School nurses came about the idea, at least staying home when sick, washing hands, very well masking and school lunch programs. School closures though in worldwide, despite UNICEF um, urging from very early on, starting in May 2020, not to close schools because of the, the impact and the needs, of, especially of women, uh, girls for schools um, were not heated. So India, unfortunately, has actually kept their schools closed for almost two years. Low income schools, not high income. And then in the United States, the school closures tended to be more in, um, in the states here, including our own in California. Um, that has led to national health emergencies and children's mental health and young people's mental health, which was declared by the um, by both AAP, but also importantly by the Surgeon General about a month later about the, the mental health crisis in young people. And so I'll end with the concept of harm reduction. In in the in the setting of harm in the setting of HIV, we actually, in a way, I think not in a way, we invented the concept of harm reduction in HIV. And what harm reduction is is an attempt to lower the impact of a pathogen. In the case of COVID-19, it'd be cases and hospitalizations. It originated from HIV, so it would be lowering HIV infections by essentially advising individuals how to mitigate the risk, but also acknowledging the real world conditions that may lead individuals to take some risks. And that include essential work, failure to provide sick leave, failure to provide um, support during closures, loneliness, and the desire to see loved ones, which both of those are aspects of um, human health and humanity. And so harm reduction really should acknowledge the holistic experience of individuals, even in the context of a pathogen, which is actually a strategy that was used more in San Francisco with HIV. The kind of um, harm reduction strategies would be encouraging outdoor activities, outdoor playgrounds, outdoor dining, these kind of things that increase ventilation. Um, uh, the economy is, um, it has something to do with health. Um, harm reduction uh, doesn't mean abstinence, but telling people how to stay safe. Um, and, and harm reduction in HIV did not involve abstinence, at least it, it did by Reagan, but it didn't by, by public health officials. It was really telling people how to stay safe in the context of a circulating human pathogen. And then compassionate messaging and acknowledging the mental health effects and the effects of prolonged closures and loneliness and providing support to workers if businesses are closed and providing the appropriate masks. Um, and I'll go back to masks in a minute. Actually, the, in terms of masks, the appropriate masks, to be clear, are doesn't have to be just an N95, which can be uncomfortable. It's an N95, a KN95, something called an FFP2, which is a really good mask, a KF94, a double mask with a surgical plus cloth, and then the final option is cloth with a filter inside that you can change because the polypropylene material of the surgical mask um, with a double mask or the polypropylene material of the filter inside actually physically repels the virus. And it can be more comfortable to wear a cloth mask with that filter inside and you change that filter every three days. Um, the polypropylene material is negatively charged. So it, it physically repels the virus and that's an advantage over cloth. 
Um, the other thing in terms of provision of support, I think a good example is like with the cholera pandemic, when we think about harm reduction, John Snow is the father of epidemiology and he closed the water pump in London in a poor area, but he didn't close it uh, and didn't provide water. Essentially, if public health um, requires closures, then people still need water, which is food and housing to survive um, in the setting of, co of COVID, for example. And in the case of, of, of the pump, you need water because differentially, pandemics always affect the poor differentially. And then to remember that there's COVID and then there's all the other overlapping effects, which is why, which uh, collateral damage of, of responding to one virus. And it is important to remember that what's been going on with tuberculosis, with HIV, with malaria, with measles vaccinations, with other childhood vaccinations, with overdoses, with sexual health, loneliness, housing increases in housing insecurity, food insecurity, and poverty. Um, so I'll end there and see what questions you have for me.